Welcome everybody uh, to class this afternoon, our Israel Education Online Series with our amazing AMHSI Alexander Musk High School and Israel Educators. This is a joint project between Jewish National Fund and Alexander Musk High School in Israel. Uh, today, our uh, teacher hails from the great state of Pennsylvania, the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and uh, the great city of Philadelphia. His name is Danny Stein. Danny grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and attended the Jack M. Barrick Hebrew Academy, formerly known as Akiba Hebrew Academy, for middle and high school. In 11th grade, he came to AMHSI with his class for four months. It was then that Danny's tenure with AMHSI began. After graduating from the University of Maryland with a BA in history and a BA in psychology, and spending time in different corners of the world, Danny turned to Israel as a counselor, as a madrich at AMHSI. He, it was there then that he met his wife, Chana, who was his co-counselor. After a year at Yeshivat Hamiftar and Efrat, Danny came back to AMHSI in 2008 a third time, this time as a teacher and educator. Danny and Chana lived on campus where Danny was also director of dormitory life and spirituality. Today, they live in Mosheva Mevo Medim and are proud parents of Adva, Neve Chaim, and I don't think your baby is new anymore. So how old is your youngest? There's actually two more now. There's, uh, two more now. Let's see how old this is. So we've got two more added to that list, and their names are? Oria and Liam. The last one. Oria and Liam. We need to update your profile. Well, Danny, uh, thank you. Picture. Oh, we got a picture here. We're going to share the picture. Oh, <laughs> it is a chamudim. Look at those cuties. Unbelievable. And I, Danny, I know we're recording, but I'm going to assume they're all still Philadelphia sports fans. Obviously, obviously. Of course, of course. <laughs> fly, Eagles, fly. Um, so without further ado, it is really uh, our honor to turn the class over to Danny Stein. Welcome, everybody. I uh, hope you guys can hear me okay. And uh, I'm especially excited to see all my former students. Welcome, guys. Love you guys. Um, so I'll get right into it. And I thought to talk about, uh, well, let's put it like this. I think that these are very challenging times right, for a lot of us. There's no end to the amount of challenges that people are dealing with right now. Um, and uh, for some of us, this is possibly the most challenging time ever. You know, some of us, you know, the younger people here, this might be the most challenging thing you've ever done, staying away from all your friends in your house with nothing to do basically for weeks and who knows how, right? For those of us with kids, that's a challenge. I can go on and on and on about it, how challenging this time is for each one of us has our various challenges that we're dealing with in terms of this whole coronavirus um, uh, issue, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I thought to talk about the idea of challenge in Judaism. What does Jewish history teach us about challenge um, and difficulty? And, uh, and what does Judaism have to say about this, this, this whole idea? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that, in fact, maybe the first ever Jewish value is the idea of overcoming challenges. People talking about Jewish values, they think about, you know, I don't know, giving tzedakah, tikkun olam, community, and all these things are great. Um, but I'm actually going to say that, that, uh, that a Jewish value, in fact, is overcoming challenges. And I want us to be able to use that in terms of these challenging times ahead. Um, I just thought I'd you know, throw out there what, what Judaism, what not, not, not the Jewish religion, what Jewish history has to say about this. Um, and I'm going to get to the end of the story. And the end of the story is that we're the most resilient people ever. <laughs> and that we are amazing at overcoming challenges. That we have it ingrained in us. That we are an incredible, incredibly resilient people that has met and overcome challenges over and over and over again. Um, we'll be talking in a couple days about the fact that we managed to survive and overcome 400 years of slavery in Egypt. I don't think that was very easy. Uh, we're gonna talk about that, you know, and, and, and then, you know, those of you who are sat in my class, you know that um, when the Babylonians exiled us and enslaved us in the year 586 BCE, 2,500 years ago, uh, we should have basically disappeared as a people. We should no longer exist, honestly, because no people has ever survived anything like that. No people has ever survived um, being exiled from their land forcibly and taken captive as a nation and being kicked out of their land. And 70 years later, when we came back, 50 years later, I can be more accurate, when we came back, we became the first people to ever do that, ever. Um, and the only people that's ever done it, except that we've done it a second time as well. Because when the Romans did it, uh, we came back again. We came back a third time. This time it took us about 1900 years. Um, and those 1900 years weren't simple, right? And we're talking about, you know, how the question is, what's the deal with all it, the Jewish people seems to be really adept at overcoming challenges. We have dealt with, like I said, the, the Babylonians, the Romans, uh, we had to deal with the Persians and the story of Purim and, and deal with that. 
We had to deal in, in Ashkenaz and the Crusades and surviving all those horrific disasters. And what happened to us in the Spanish Inquisition and in Poland in the 1600s and in Russia in the 17 and 1800s and all those evil czars. And, um, and it goes on and on and on. Now, and now we live in a country um, which basically has not known peace, true peace, for a minute. We've been either in low-level conflict or serious war since the first second that we were created. Um, and despite all of that, we have this incredible thriving country um, with an amazing, you know, we're talking about a place in which people have a good standard of living. We have a fully functioning government all the time that gets everything done perfect. Wait, I'll stop there. Okay, that was not accurate, but, but uh, everything besides everything else is true, just not that one. Hopefully in a week we'll get one of those too. Um, but the point is, guys, um, and the question is how? How? How have we done this? How, how are we so good at, uh, at overcoming challenges? Right? Because I'll, I'll just share, share a screen for a second and I'll, I'll show one quick thing. Um, give me one quick second. I'm still getting used to this Zoom business. But it's not just that we have a democracy. And it's not just that we have a beautiful country. And it's not just that we overcome all these various conflicts. But uh, modern day, I knew this shared screen business was going to throw me off. Okay, hang on. <laughs> um, we also got this, right? We also got the fact that we're the startup nation, and it's amazing. And we, it's, not just, it's not just that we have like an okay economy. We're like leading the world in all these various directions and technology. We have no natural resources. It's another challenge that we're, that we're meeting and beating every single day. These are, of course, are just some of the most famous Israeli inventions over the last you know, 70 years. But... The point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, the Jewish people is no stranger to challenge, okay? And the fact that we are dealing with challenging times and it's hard for all of us, yes, it is hard for all of us, and each one of us has our various different ways that it's hard. Um, but I wanna give you guys a little bit of inspiration and let you guys know that, that you are part of a people, that we are all part of a people that has been dealing with this kind of stuff um, and much worse since the beginning, and that we are uniquely, uniquely equipped to deal with it. Um, so what am I talking about? Wow, how? How is it? Where, where, is this, where is this ability to overcome challenges come from? Um, and I'm going to say that it comes from the very first moment that Judaism is introduced to the world, according to the Tanakh. Okay, we're going to, for the purpose of this discussion, we're going to take um, the idea of God out of the story, right? We're, obviously, anything that ever happened in Judaism, we could all, we could all say, well, God made it that way. That, that, that may be true, but we'll leave that out for now. We'll talk more logically. And I'm going to say that the first thing that ever happened that was Jewish ever in the world um, had to do with challenges. So what am I talking about? Let's go back here. I'm talking about the idea of Lech Lecha, right? Because before Lech Lecha, before God says to Abraham, go forth from your, native, from your native land, right? To the place that I will show you. Before that, it wasn't a uniquely Jewish story, okay? But with Lech Lecha, we'll just read the Pasuk out for a second. Right? Vayomer Hashem, El Avram, Lech Lecha, go for you. Meretzcha, mimoletetcha, mi beit avicha, el haaretz asher recha. Which means, right, the Lord said to Avram, go forth from your native land, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. And it goes on and on from there. So what does this have to do with challenge? So I want to look at the map. Right? My students will hopefully remember doing this on second or third day of class. I know it's a little blurry, but this one actually has Abraham's path charted out for us in a really nice way. And this is the first part of the story. What am I, why are we so good at overcoming challenges? Well, I want you to look at what Abraham has done here. Okay? Because after being told lech lecha, after being told to go, Abraham, who starts here over in basically ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Babylonia, what we now, basically modern day Iraq. Okay? And this area of the world is called, this, this shape that I'm doing with my mouse over here, this is the Fertile Crescent, okay? The Middle East is also, also called the Fertile Crescent. It's the beginning of civilization. Why is it fertile? Because you have the Tigris and the Euphrates over here. You have the Nile down here, okay? And this whole area, because, right, the rest of it's a giant desert, but this area, you have the Fertile Crescent, and these rivers allow giant empires and civilizations to, um, to come about for the first time, okay? But what Abraham does is something basically inexplicable. Again, you could say God, but we're going to leave God out of the story for now. Abraham goes from here, which is if you look at the green, it is by far the most fertile part of the Fertile Crescent. He's living next to the Tigris and the Euphrates, where he can farm easily and have an easy life. And the promised land that he goes to 
is this over here, which if you can look at the green versus the tan, what's fertile, what's not fertile, he goes from the most fertile part of the, of the fertile crescent to the least fertile part of the fertile crescent, which if you think about it, is just stupid. It's just utter stupidity. Back in the day, there were no supermarkets. And if you didn't have a supermarket, right? If you don't have a supermarket and the land is not fertile, then you're simply gonna die, right? So the idea that somebody would voluntarily, and again, you could say God, but let's leave God out. The idea that somebody would make that move, even, even if it is God, whoever decided that our promised land should be basically the middle of a giant desert, that to, to have the guy that's starting our people go from the most fertile part of the fertile crescent and leave that area and leave it to the least, and go to the least fertile part is just basic, it's just basic, it's just unintelligent. It just doesn't make any sense. Nobody should ever do that, especially not in the ancient world, when you relied on the land completely. It gets worse than that. It's not just that this is a, it's not just that, that geographically we're in the least fertile part. It's also the fact that if you look, again, if you, if you just think about the map, I'll show it again. If you think about the map, guys, you also have an empire down here, that's Egypt. You have a constantly empires over here. You have the Mesopotamians. They end up being the Assyrians, the Babylonians, various empires. The Persians are going to be over here. And we're going to be stuck in the middle between two giant empires always. And these giant empires are always going to be trying to expand. Okay? And the first place you're going to want to expand is the major highways that connect basically three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe up here. Right? And those highways go right through the land of Israel. So not only is this place not fertile, it's also smack in the middle of two empires, which are always going to be trying to expand and take it over. And last but not least, um, there's going to be another farming problem, which is that we couldn't, there, there are, I mean, if, you, if you've seen it, there are flat areas in Israel, right, which should be easy to farm. Tel Aviv, for example, Hoda Sharon, where, where a lot of us spend time. <coughs> there's, no, there's no hills there. It's part of the coastal plain, and it's fertile. You can farm there. We couldn't settle there. Avraham doesn't settle there. When we come back to the land with Yehoshua, Joshua, and the story of the Shoftim, the judges, we can't settle the flat ground because the flat ground was basically taken by various enemies, usually the Philistines, and they had much better weapons than us. And on flat ground, they could basically destroy us very easily. Their chariots were no match for us. And we didn't, so even after everything, so we have an infertile land, okay, or the least fertile part of the fertile crescent at least. We have the fact that it's being constantly attacked by empires. And we have the fact that we, we, when we go there, we can't settle in the parts that are easy to farm. We have to settle basically in the hills. And the hills of Israel are extraordinarily rocky. So how to farm rock, especially when it's on like a 70 degree angle going like this, is extremely difficult. Um, but it's not impossible. And that's the point. The point is that it's not impossible. And, and those of us that have been on the program, you guys probably remember, we went to Sataf. We saw two of the solutions that, um, that the Jewish people are going to perfect, right? One of which being finding water inside the mountain, cave irrigation. One of which being is cutting the steps out of the mountain, what we call terraces, like terrace farming. Think Machu Picchu, but, uh, but you can think the land of Israel also. Because when you're farming a rocky hill, that's the way to do it, okay? And the point here is that the land is difficult, but it's not impossible, okay? Um, and the two things, by the way, this is kind of just an aside, actually, but it's interesting. The two things, if you think about the, the, the major challenges we're talking about, oh, I guess I should say one more thing. One more thing in terms of farming is it only rains here half the year, which means, right, in, in, in a country where it rains all the time, like the United States of America, you can farm all the time. But here in the ancient world, when, it, when you're only getting water from the sky for half the year, then you have half the year that you can't farm a thing. And that's a huge challenge. Again, so you're going to have to dig into the mountains, find water that's in the groundwater inside the mountains, find a way to channel it out, ration it. It's a whole long story, and it's difficult. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting, kind of just an aside about this, which I find fascinating, is that if you think of our challenges that we've mentioned so far, the farming issue and the military issue, right, the fact that we're always going to, right, in order to survive here in the middle of, of basically the worst part of the Fertile Crescent for all kinds of reasons, in order to survive in this land, we're going to have to get good at two things, right? We're right in the middle. We're going to have to get really good at farming. Otherwise, we have no chance of survival. And we'll have to get really good at fighting as well. What's fascinating about that, I think, is that the ancient Jews were, the ancient Israelites were really good at farming and really good at fighting. We'd be the Greeks. We went against the Romans, we, right? And we were great. And if you think about it, it's not like Jews in all of history have been like that. Jews in the Middle Ages in Europe, certainly not in the United States of America now, not exactly known for their prowess in either farming or fighting. 
But fascinatingly, we come back to Israel 100 years ago, and all of a sudden, what are Jews amazing at again? Farming and fighting. And that's going to be kind of a hint, okay? We, we become amazing at farming and fighting again. And the point that I'm trying to make is that this land, <clears throat> so why, why does God or Avraham or whoever it was that chose this spot for us, why would you choose such a stupid spot? Such an infertile, challenging, militarily problematic spot. And the answer is that this land is a challenging one. It's a difficult place to be. Um, what types of traits would someone need, would a people need, in order to survive in such a challenging land? Maybe strong, maybe resilient, maybe stubborn, maybe like annoyingly stubborn. Has anybody ever here ever met a stubborn Israeli who cut you off while driving or wouldn't back down from a parking spot? Right? People always wonder why are Israelis so aggressive and so stubborn? Well, what I'm trying to argue here is that the land makes us that way. And we've always been that way. And if we weren't like that, if we weren't stubborn as hell and strong and resilient, then we'd have no chance of surviving here in the first place. And now I'll get to like the kind of like what I think is maybe the most incredible part of this whole story is that, well, well why does Abraham, okay, so why does Abraham need us to be so strong for God or whoever it is that, chose that, that got us here? Why do we need to be so strong? Well, if you know you're starting a new religion, that's going to be persecuted, if you know that ahead of time, then, and you know that this people might go through some of the things that we've been through, right? Like 2,000 years of anti-Semitism culminating in the Holocaust and still, met, and, you, and you want this people to survive that, this people's gonna have to be strong. It's gonna have to be a strong, resilient people that knows how to deal with challenges. And what I'm saying is that we've been like that from the first minute Judaism was introduced to humanity. The first thing that ever happened was that the Jews were taken or the Jews were born in a place that forced us to constantly deal with challenges and become a strong, resilient, and stubborn people. And if you think of our history, we needed that badly. If we didn't have that, we would have had no chance. We would have not been the first. If we weren't strong, resilient, and stubborn, we would not have been the only people to ever survive the Babylonian exile or the Roman exile, or the Crusades, or Russia, or the Holocaust, or any of these things that could have wiped us out. Now, one little aside, again, it's not the main point, but I think it's worth noting. Well, why, I mean, how did Abraham know this? Or guy, what, what is it about, I don't want to get into the whole, why are we persecuted? That's a whole other discussion that we could have with a, diff a different class. But people often think, you know, well, it's because we were accused of, of killing Jesus, or because we're always rich, and we're scapegoats, and there's an incredible book about this that, that more or less disproves that, those ideas and says those are all symptoms of the problem. But the problem exists before that stuff, it exists independent of that stuff. And one of, if not the main reason, is simply that we are about to, and Abraham knows this, or God knows this, whoever it was, Abraham knows that he's about to start a religion that's basically going to tell everyone in the world, you have to meet a universal higher moral standard. No excuses. And that's a big threatening thing for a lot of people, right? And there's an amazing quote by, by I forget his name, but he was a, he was a very, very famous um, Catholic. He was a bishop and he was a thinker. And he said, the burden of monotheism, the burden of higher morality has been brought to us by the Jews. As great as that is, they've never been forgiven for it. And one of the reasons, if not the main reason why we've been persecuted is because it's in our religion to basically say, no, it's not, not, not everything goes, but everyone has to meet a higher moral standard. Um, and if you know you're about to start a religion that says that, and you know we're gonna be persecuted for that, then you better find a place or find a way to make us strong and resilient. And what better way than to put us in a country that forces us to work really hard and overcome all kinds of challenges. Now, there's a really cool book about this idea. Um, it's called Prisoner of Geography by Tim Marshall. And basically it says exactly what I'm saying right now. It doesn't talk specifically so much about Israel, but it says that, that you can understand a nation, its people, and its, uh, and its personality and its political decisions based on geography. It tells the story of politics and of, of nations' personalities through the geography. So if you think about it, like, I mean, it's an, I'll use the most obvious example, but why is it that whenever we go on vacation to a tropical island, everyone that lives there is always so freaking nice? Everyone's always so nice on a tropical island. Or if you've ever been to Australia, everyone's so nice there. Well, if you think about it, where's their nearest enemy? 
<laughs> when was the last time they had to fight a war on their territory? When um, everyone lives on the most gorgeous beach ever and chills out all day, of course you're going to be nice. Well, those are not luxuries that we have over here in Israel, in a place where basically for 4,000 years, including now, we're constantly doing things like fending off attack, drilling into the ground, no natural resources, having to scrape by in order to, in order to not just survive, but thrive. But it's not simple, right? Of course people in Australia will be nice. That makes sense. And it also makes sense, if you think about it, why Israelis are going to be, look, we're also nice, but we're also <laughs> really stubborn and not always nice, right? We don't exactly say, no worries, mate, um, because that's not how it is over here. We, well, unfortunately, we have worries. But I'm saying that those worries have given us an amazing tool. They've turned us into this amazing, strong, stubborn, resilient people. And that's what allowed us to, to, to survive all these incredible challenges that come from basically starting monotheism. Um, now, what's incredible about this is that we now have basically 4,000 years of challenges making us stronger, right? The first thing that ever happened to us was Abraham going to a challenging land. That was a challenge. And from then on, if you read this, the Tanakh, and then if you look at the rest of Jewish history, I already went through it pretty quickly. There's no end to the number of challenges and disasters and debacles. We had a lot of incredible years too, but we had more than our fair share of challenges. And all these things have, again, served the purpose of making us strong. So one thing I'll say about that is given our Jewish history, this whole Corona business, as unfortunate as it is, and it really is unfortunate, but for us Jews, I want to say like katana like it's is, is in Hebrew, like it's small on us, meaning it's like no big deal. Like we can deal with it. Okay, we've dealt with much worse before and we can deal with this as well. And we have 4,000 years of dealing with things that have been much, I think, worse than this, as difficult as this one is. But it's not just the idea. Challenges don't just make you. So it's great that it makes, right, that, 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 that we are good at overcoming challenges, that we are stubborn and resilient and, um, and what did I say, and strong and whatever. I'm, those are the three words I'm using, but I could have used another, you know, 10 words to describe people that would have to, to live in this type of land. Um, but there's another aspect of challenge, where I think, which I think is really important. Um, and that is something that um, a lot of people know this, but it's hard to always live this way. Ben Gurion certainly knew it, right? And he used to talk about the idea that human beings grow through challenge. That's how we grow. Okay, like a plant grows through photosynthesis and sunlight and water. We don't need that stuff. We need that stuff too, I guess. But we need challenge in order to grow as people. Um, and if you think about that, I mean, we can think about all the various times in Jewish history where the Jewish people have been challenged and overcome it. But one of the most amazing examples of this is, um, is the early Zionists. Let me see if I can show you this other picture. Hold on. The early Zionists, oh, one second. I want to share a quick picture with you guys. Right, early Zionist guys, 1881, 1903, first and second Aliot. So I'll just show you a really great classic Zionist picture. And that is this one, right? You have all these incredible, um, I, again, I could have picked a lot of various moments from Jewish history in terms of like, when has the Jewish people really, you know, faced a challenge and overcome it and been resilient. But the, this is the labor Zionists, right? The labor Zionists in the late 1800s, early 1900s, who had this incredible, incredible quote the motto they lived by, which was Anu Banu Artsa, Livnot Ulihibanotba. Anu Banu Artsa means we came to this land. The second part is right here on the screen. Livnot Ulihibanotba, to build and be built by it. So I'm gonna say Abraham was the first labor Zionist. That quote's not in the Tanakh, but it might as well, might as well have been. Because the idea that we come to this land to build it, right, to start our nation here, but also to be built by it. Okay, and, and essentially what we're talking about in terms of like the early Zionists and the challenges that, that they met, um, they had to start from, from basically scratch. There was basically nothing here, almost nothing. They had to hand plant every tree. They had to build every building, every institution. They had to build a functioning government for a bunch of people that were running away from persecution. They had to make a country and somehow this country has actually worked and, and survived and not just survived, but thrived and I would say for us to like kind of appreciate it, I mean, just think about that feeling that you get when you're building a piece of furniture from Ikea, right? We all know that feeling. You come home from Ikea, you got like your desk or your chair or whatever, 
you take it out of the box, and it's just a bunch of pieces of wood. It doesn't look like anything. And your first reaction, at least my first reaction when this happens, is like one of like, oh, this is going to suck. I'm not going to, right? And then, whatever it is, three, four, five hours later, I have a fully functioning desk in my, in my study. And this amazing feeling, I just, I just had a challenge and beat it and grew from it. And next time that I have that, next time I get a piece of furniture from Ikea, I know that I can do it, right? Because when you, when you take a challenge and meet it and overcome it, essentially what it does is it, get, it makes you that much stronger, right? So I don't want to talk about just the, like challenges are important. It's cool that we're resilient, but it's more than that. Because if you are constantly challenged and constantly overcoming those challenges, then what you can do is grow as a person or really for us as a nation that much more. We're a nation of people. We didn't just build a bunch of Ikea desks. I mean, think about how good you feel. How, how accomplished do you feel when you build a desk from Ikea? You feel really good. Now imagine not building a desk from Ikea, but building an entire country from scratch. You feel really good, really good. And that's what our people did 100 years ago. And we were able to do that again because of our incredible ability to overcome challenges and be resilient. Um, and it's in, it's in our DNA. And that's why the labor Zionists in the, in, in the late 18 or 1900s, when they came here, it was obvious for them. They sought out the challenge. They embraced the challenge. And they said, this is what we're here for. Because not only are we going to fix this country and make it an incredible country, which it is, but we're actually going to make the Jews that much stronger as well. And if you think about the Jews and the, you know, what we've gone through in the last 2,000 years, in the early 1900s, we weren't exactly, I wouldn't call us strong. Right, where there was pogroms in Russia, you can go on and on, but we, we weren't strong. But coming to Israel to build this place and be built by it, well, 100 years later, we are really damn strong. And we are as resilient as ever, if not more. And we're the startup nation. And we're the, we have a thriving economy. And we can have, right? And, and even, in, even in the coronavirus, you know, there's lots of people, there's a, there's a narrative in Israel of like, you know, a lot of people, some people love Bibi. Even the people that hate him are like, he's doing a pretty good job on this one. Right? There's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that because we are so good, it's, 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 it's our history, it's our personality as a nation. It's, I think after 4,000 years, it's literally ingrained in our DNA to be able to meet challenges and overcome them and thus get stronger um, and become better people. And so, I mean, that's essentially how we were able to take an arid desert. You know, if we, if we, if we remember what this was, if you've seen pictures, I don't have a good one to, sh to show you guys right now, but if, but to see a picture of Israel in the late 1800s, you know, and then see the exact same place right now, the difference is mind blowing. This place was a, was a desert with nothing. And any of us who have been here recently or in the last 30 years knows this place is a gorgeous, green, lush, beautiful place. And that's because of the incredible work of the resilient, strong, stubborn Jews that came here and the first and second Aliyot in the, 19, in the early 18th and late 18 and early 1900s. But it really goes all the way back to Abraham and Lechlecha. The idea that we have this ingrained in us, that we can meet challenges. We had been doing it for 4,000 years straight. And look, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a marine biologist. I know a lot of us, raise your hand if you also had that dream when you were a kid, I'm just curious. If that was just me. I know when I was a kid, I knew a lot of other people, whatever. Okay, it doesn't matter. But I, I wanted to be a marine biologist. Okay, I was like totally into fish. I still am, I love it. And there's one really amazing thing that I saw um, recently, actually, which made me go back to my whole marine biology days as a kid. And, uh, and it's the idea that there's all kinds of shellfish, we use lobsters as a great example, okay, that have the following uh, life cycle. Basically what they do, they, they are a soft animal that lives inside a hard shell for protection, okay? And that hard shell cannot get any bigger. In order to grow, what happens is they, inside the shell, start feeling very uncomfortable, okay? They have a serious amount of discomfort. They're dealing with something difficult. They then go somewhere. They then shed their shell, grow a little bit, form a new shell, and now they're safe again. But if you think about what spurred that growth, it was the discomfort, the difficulty. Right? The fact that they were being squeezed in their shell. That's what spurred them to grow. And we, I think human beings are like that. But the important message that I'm trying to get across is that we Jews are uniquely 
like that. Our history has made us that way, right? That difficulty, we are used to difficulty. We know how to deal with it and we know that we will grow from it. And so as difficult as these times are, and they are extraordinarily difficult, we are uniquely, uniquely equipped to deal with them, to overcome them because we are that strong, resilient people going back from Avraham all the way to right now, 2020. Um, and not just overcome them, but grow from them and use them to make us stronger, better, and deeper people. And I am sure that when we look back on this, whenever it is, however many weeks or months it will be ahead, I'm sure um, that we will feel that we have grown from this incredible challenge that we will have experienced and overcome. And that I think is the Jewish history message of challenges in these uh, difficult times. So that's it, Greg. Danny. Um, awesome. Um, before we uh, open it up to questions, um, what I'm gonna actually do is, give me one second. Um, so I've officially locked the meeting so no new attendees can join, um, which means that everybody here, um, you can raise your hand, everybody here, one second. Uh, hopefully nobody slipped through. Uh, I'm gonna give everybody the chance to unmute themselves and we can ask questions, but I'm gonna ask that we use that unmute um, judiciously. Um, raise your hand either via the electronically or I'm gonna open up the chat to, um, to everybody. Um, so this way you can ask questions of Danny um, through the chat or through raising your hand and uh, unmute and mute yourself um, judiciously. I do wanna say that for those of you who joined us late, I got one other announcement. <laughs> please email me. I only got about 10 or 15 emails. So please email me at glitkovsky, G L-I-T-C-O-F-S-K-Y at A-M-H-S-I dot O-R-G. I'm putting it in the chat now. Um, and let us know how you heard about us, how you heard about this class, if you're an alumni or an alumnus, uh, alumna, where you're from, um, and especially how you heard about this class. Getting a lot of folks heard about it on social media, which is great. Uh, we're trying to put a lot more out on social media. So Danny, thank you for such a great class. And um, Let's open it up to your students, old and new alike, for questions. Feel free, guys. Anything, anything, anything. <laughs> I literally hear crickets outside. It's actually crickets. <laughs> That's okay. Hi, I'm Nolan. I was in Danny's class in the summer of 2017. My mom and I are watching from Atlanta. And this is very exciting. Thank you, Danny. And thank you to everyone else from us. This is, this is wonderful. And his brother, who's also your alumni, is watching it in the other room. Yeah, I see Hunter here. Thank you for joining us from Atlanta. So we have a question uh, from David, but I don't know David's last name. So David, go ahead and um, if you can unmute yourself, go ahead and unmute yourself or type it in the uh, chat. I'm here. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I'm David Mellis. I am actually a Bear. Uh, I'm a Bear Keeper Academy student who is an alumni of uh, AMH, AMH, AMHSI from 2019. And I have a, I just want to say, Danny, thank you so much for this. I learned a lot for what I've uh, seen so far. And during this um, whole pandemic, this whole world pandemic, what do you think differs uh, how Israelis act to this pandemic to how Americans act? Like, it's hard, it's a hard question to, ex to explain, but I think it's important from a very, um, Right. So that is a great question. Uh, it's a great question. All I know about America is what, I've, what I'm seeing on the news, so I can't really yeah. speak about it. I can tell you what I... Listen, there's a number of, of ways, a number of answers here. I think the most obvious one, and I'm not sure it's one that I feel 100% comfortable with, but it is the reality, um, is humor. I don't know, a lot of you guys, and, and I think part of that might be that in Israel, honestly, I don't want to say this, you know, I, I say this, uh, I don't want to misspeak, but it's, let's just say it's not as serious yet as it is in America. And so maybe, maybe we won't be laughing in, in a couple of weeks. But right now, there's an element of like, you know, we, we in Israel, we know about the idea of, uh, of having to laugh at even at the difficult things. Otherwise, if you can't, if you can't laugh at the difficult things, then, then and you're a Jew, then you're going to have a hard time. Um, 
And so there's been a lot of, you know, what my WhatsApps and, and it's amazing how many hysterical, hysterical memes and uh, videos being passed around. And uh, I mean, some of them have, become, you know, have gone viral worldwide. Some of them I'm sure you guys have seen, like that famous woman who's in her car talking about the distance learning is really funny. There's another one where this woman is really hilarious, where she's, um, where she is basically talking about how everything's fine. Don't worry, this is great. My new routine's awesome. She's got wine and cookies and everything's cool. And then as she pans around, she says, look outside. It's like even a nice day. She pans outside and you see her kids are tied up with duct tape and they're tied to a chair. Everything's fine. This is a great new routine. No problems. There's a lot of that stuff going around on, on uh, WhatsApp over here. And it's really, really funny. And I don't get the impression that as much of that is happening in America. I'm not sure. Um, but I don't get that impression. Something about the way we're, we're dealing with it is just with a lot more humor. Um, that's one thing. Look, we also have, I think that I, what I said before, the, the lockdown restrictions in Israel have been, have been strict from the beginning. They're extremely strict right now. And they're national, by the way. There's no, you know, different counties, different cities. You guys have different counties, different cities. It's a whole thing. We had basically have, um, at this point, like one guy and his advisors deciding for the entire country. Right now, you can't go more than a 100 meters from your house. And they're actually giving out tickets um, if you do, if you're, if you're caught. Okay, I know a, a person who just got a ticket riding her bike in the middle of the forest, she's my neighbor, yesterday. Um, and that's, you know, as, as, as much as America is under lockdown, it's not as under as strict of lockdown as Israel. And that has done a lot of, I mean, that in terms of in, politically in the government, that's how, you know, that's one of the main, major differences. Um, Israel seems to have taken this thing um, more serious and taken the lockdown thing much more extremely um, than many other countries have, including the U.S., and that's affected us in all kinds of ways, um, positive health-wise, but negative in terms of you know the workforce and things like that. Um, so this is just two of the two two reasons, two ways in which it's different. Um, I could probably go on and on, but I guess I'll take another question. I was gonna say, Danny, I think I just to, just to add to that is in the United States there are definitely a lot of memes and videos going around um, about, and I would say that it's about not the pandemic but the experience. Right, right, right. Of, 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 of what we're going through. Um, we have time probably for one or two more questions. Um, if there are others, you can raise your hand or like I said, judiciously, Amaya Shavit, you have a question. Thank you for uh, using the chat. Go ahead, Maya. Hi, Danny. Hey, Maya. I just wanna let you know that me and a bunch of the other Barrick students have our core notebooks right here and mine's right here. And you basically did our entire first lesson word for word. Not word for word, but okay. <laughs> and then the Satov one, which Benji did for us, you were pretty close with that one too. Okay, um, my question was about the unity government. I want to know what your take is on where it stands right now and how it will, how you think it will proceed in this interesting time, especially with Bibi Netanyahu's um, health status as well. Like, what do you think will happen within the next couple weeks and months the Israeli government? My, that's a great question. You know that I'm not one for predictions, although nine out of 10 times I do get them right. So uh, <laughs> so what do I think is gonna happen? Look, that's a, that's a really tough one. It's especially tough because as much as the headlines a week ago were we have a unity government, in fact, that's proven to really not be the case yet. Um, and there's still the, the negotiations that are happening right now to try to make that unity government official have been uh, more difficult than I think most people realized. And so I actually don't want to speculate on whether we will actually succeed in getting that unity government or not. I really hope if, 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 they, if, if, if both sides declare that this is going to happen and then it falls through, I will be even more disappointed with the political system in Israel than I was before the three elections. And I already was pretty disappointed. So I really hope they hammer this out. I think it would be a, a, a new level of, of sad if they weren't able to work this out after finally essentially working it out. Um, look, BB's health, he's not, at this point, unless I missed a headline, um, he's in self-quarantine, but that's, he, he would test negative for, for the virus, and uh, I don't think anybody thinks that he's sick unless I missed something. Let me know if I did. But, uh, but that means, look, you have two options. Either you have BB's continuous leadership, like he's been doing in these transition governments, until the next election, which could happen. Um, or BB makes a government uh, without Benny Gantz, right? Which, which, which in theory, now that blue and white has fallen apart, that's a, now a new possibility. Um, or you have what, what Gantz and BB presented to us a week ago, which is that they're gonna find a way to work this out and they're gonna have a government for at least a year and a half, if not more than that, um, where they'll be sharing most of the important positions. And that's what I think um, 
that's what the majority of Israelis, I think, voted for. The two of the idea that the two of them should at this point find a way to work together, um, even though nobody really is going to be perfectly happy in that case. But that's what coalition politics is all about. No one's ever perfectly happy. Um, everyone has to compromise and be kind of bummed out. That's pretty much how it always works. In this case, it's actually a bit more extreme, but but uh, so I don't want to say which one of those three options is more likely. I'm uh, you know, if you want me to make a guess, it will, it will put it in the nine out of ten. I'm going to guess that number. I'm going to guess they will hammer this out. I'm going to guess that, that that because their reputations are both on the line and they presented the entire country that they're going to have a government. I'm, I believe they're going to find a way to work it out. But I wouldn't be that shocked if I was wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question, but there's also a um, a chat that says, "Danny, uh, would you recommend the book you referenced to build and be built uh, on Amazon if people on Amazon can get it?" So I'll be honest, that book I have not read. I was just looking for an image that said that quote on it. So I don't know about that book, but I will recommend two other books right now um, that, I, that I took uh, that took things out of that are, that are incredible, absolutely incredible. One is, like I said, Prisoners of Geography by Tim Marshall. It's an amazing book just to understand how the world is actually a function of, of where we live and what our geography lets us do. And there's another book um, called Why the Jews, which anyone in my class knows that I recommend this all the time which explains in an incredible way the, the reasons behind anti-Semitism, which are not the ones that most people think. Um, I'll recommend those two books, but the one that I showed the image of, I actually cannot recommend it, haven't, haven't read that one. Awesome. Um, we have time for one last question. Danny, what in your opinion is the most awesome example of the Jews adapting to challenges? Adapting, or, uh, or maybe I'll rephrase and say overcoming challenges. Um, look, I think I'm going to have to go like this. I think I'm going to have to say, I'm, I'm going to cheat on your question. Well, if I, okay, if I have to choose one, if I have to choose one, I will say the fact that after the exile, basically after we lost to the Romans, you know, over the course of a couple revolts, in the in you know about approximately you know 1900 years ago the fact that we managed to stick together even when we weren't together and overcome that and come back i think so so if i have to say like, like the roman defeat and exile and subsequent return but that's really kind of like half of jewish history so what i really want to say is cheat on your question and say and say the jewish history as a the jewish story as a whole not that we're at its end but if you think about where, 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 it, where it came from, and when we talk about, you know, start with, with Pesach, right, which is coming up, the exodus from Egypt and coming to the land and being kicked out once and coming back and being kicked out twice and anti-Semitism for 2,000 years and the Holocaust and then coming back and look where we are now, that full story, I just wish that some incredible director would make an unbelievable Netflix show that we could all binge watch about Jewish history and it would be the most incredible drama it would be like Game of Thrones times a million, and I want to watch it um, because I think the Jewish story as a whole is that is is really that that. Thanks, Dan. That Thanks, Dan. So, so if you know, I guess it's the Roman exile, but it's really everything that's happened since, um, is what I would say. That might have to be your next venture, Danny. Hey, so I want to um, thank everybody. Um, and most especially Danny Stein uh, for a wonderful class today. Um, I just, I thought I would, since you showed your source book, I thought I would show my source book from uh, the early 90s. Um, I still have all of them. So um, I, I, I always like sharing them with, uh, with fellow alumni. Um, I wanna just uh, say a few words uh, by way of announcement to close out the class. Um, all of our classes are recorded, so please you can go on to uh, uh, YouTube backslash Jewish National Fund uh, to watch all of our back classes that we've had over the last couple of weeks. And also this class today should be up there by the end of business today or at least before Shabbat. I also want to remind everybody that we have class every day at one o'clock, I shouldn't say every day, Monday through Thursday uh, at one o'clock. So on Monday, we'll have uh, Donnie Kandel teaching. On next Tuesday, we'll have Lisa Bitone teaching. And then we will pick up the following Monday during Chomoy Pesach. Uh, I see a few of our uh, teachers here, including David Mitchell, who will be teaching a class. Um, and I saw some others, uh, Mordechai Cohen, um, a whole lineup of our teachers from Alexander Musk High School in Israel, uh, Danny, and Danny will come back also for another date. We have our classes scheduled through the end of April, uh, again, Monday through Thursday, except for the Chagim, uh, for the, uh, for, um, 
uh, on Pesach, on uh, the Chag of Pesach, uh, every day at one o'clock, same, um, same Zoom link. And you can also please check them out uh, on our JNF uh, YouTube channel. I want to remind everybody this is a joint effort between Jewish National Fund and Alexander Moss High School in Israel. And last time, I promise, if you have not emailed me, glitkovsky at amhsi.org, please uh, email me. Let us know you were here. Let us know how you heard about us. And once again, thank you, uh, Danny, for uh, amazing teaching. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Have a uh, wonderful Shabbat. Uh, Shabbat Shalom.